Hi, my name is Jeff Petrakin. I'm an entomologist and educator at the DNA Learning Center and the Long Island Aquarium. Now, if you've been watching our episodes, our videos, you've been following along and we've talked a lot about invertebrates. So insects, spiders, corals, jellies, things like that. But we missed a lot of the animals that you might be uh, even more familiar with. And so uh, when we think of animals, we think of larger animals like mega fauna. So basically big uh, animals that live on land or in the sea. And a lot of those are very different from the invertebrates that we already got to meet. And you know, I don't never really specifically said what an invertebrate actually is. And so this right here, now you might think like, this is a snake by the way, this is Anubis. This is uh, my gray banded king snake. Uh, comes from Mexico and uh, Texas. And gray banded uh, king snakes are snakes that like to feed on other snakes, actually. That's what that name king means. Uh, they'll feed on other things as well, so I'll actually give her uh, frozen mice and things uh, to eat. But now you might think that she is all squiggly, she's all squirmy. Does she even have a skeleton? She does, actually. She does have a skeleton. She's a vertebrate. And so what a vertebrate actually is is an organism with a vertebral column and so basically what that is is a spinal column running from the uh the head the cephalic region of the organism uh, right on down to the lower reaches of the organism and they have a bone structure that arises from that that gives that organism support and so that's what a vertebrate is so it's an organism with a vertebral column so invertebrates, all the insects and spiders and things that we met on previous episodes, they don't have any of that. They have an exoskeleton, as I mentioned. So they, their skeleton is on the outside. The benefit of a vertebra is uh, essentially that the organism is able to, it gives the organism support and upright uh, structure. And it basically allows them to become these uh, huge, uh, to these huge organisms that live on land or in the sea, supporting their internal physiology. And there are a lot of distinct advantages. Now, there are not nearly as many vertebrate species as there are invertebrate species, but the vertebrates that we do know of are um, pretty memorable and pretty recognizable. And so uh, I wanted to start with one of my favorite groups of vertebrates in this series, uh, the reptiles and amphibians. So, what exactly do we mean when we talk about reptiles and amphibians? So let's start by talking about the amphibians. Before we start to meet some of the amphibians and reptiles that we have at the aquarium, I think it's a good idea to have an understanding of where we're talking about with the vertebrate tree of life. And so on the right-hand side of the screen here, you'll see um, an artist's rendering of a phylogeny or a tree of life representing all of the known vertebrates that are living today. And so if you watched our invertebrate series, you're already kind of familiar with how these phylogenetic trees work. So I'm not gonna belabor that point right now. Um, and I wanted to draw attention right over here to the middle of the tree. So this is the, these are where the amphibians and reptiles are right over here. And notice that the tree starts off with, or some of the most ancient lineages are uh, the fish and specifically hagfish, lampreys, and working on our way up to the chondriacthian and osteichthian or bony fish, um, as well as the sarcopteridians. And we'll talk a little bit more about the sarcopteridians moment, but sarcopterygians are sort of a uh, um, midway group between the uh, fish, the bony fish, as well as uh, amphibians or, or terrestrial um, um, vertebrates. And so sarcopterygians have these advantages of being, or some of them at least, have the advantage of being able to survive on land and they have these adaptations that will help them to do that. But Again, for now, we're talking about the amphibians. And so this is what we're talking about right here. They represent one of the um, um, most basal or most ancient groups of the uh, descendants of the earliest tetrapods that were thought to have colonized land. And so this word tetrapod here is pretty important. And so you'll notice that in this tree, tetrapod is the branch that, that refers to all of these groups, the amphibians, the reptiles, which includes the birds as well as the mammals. And tetrapod basically refers to the development of four limbs, which are one of the adaptive features that are thought to have helped um, the earliest terrestrial vertebrates to begin colonizing land. That along with, of course, the de development of the lungs, which these groups all over here share as well. 
And so with the amphibians, we have these, these three major lineages, the, the uh, Sicilians, the uh, salamanders, and the frogs. Now, most of these guys are frogs, I will say. I think over, I think it's like something like 80% of all amphibian species are, are frogs. But notice that they are not the same as reptiles. So even though they look superficially similar, I mean, even in this video, I'm grouping them as the same episode, right? But they're actually not really you know, very closely related to uh, what we would call reptiles at all. Um, uh, they're, they're certainly more closely related to reptiles than they are to, um, you know, mammals, let's say, but they're, they're, still, they're still a pretty distinct group in their own right. And that's because they have uh, a reliance on water and aquatic conditions still, whereas reptiles and a lot of these other groups have adaptations that allow them to survive on land, as we'll talk about. Now, if we get a look at these early tetrapods, by the way, I think one of the most common ones that you, you see talked about is this, this fella here. This is a, an artist rendering of a um, Devonian uh, period uh, creature. It's a fossil that was found right over here, actually up in Canada. Um, it's about 375 million years old. And this is known as Teak Talik, or uh, essentially one of the first, um, or it's just thought to be one of the first fishes that were uh, began, began to um, move up onto land. And so this is technically a fish, believe it or not. It's a Sarcopterygian fish, and it has these uh, little fins that are projected downwards, almost like, like four limbs of a tetrapod. And um, the, these guys are, are, again, thought to be one of the most ancient groups or ancient uh, sort of transitory uh, organisms that, that represents a transition between the aquatic fishes and the semi-aquatic, but also terrestrial uh, amphibians. And so let's meet some of these amphibians. Hi, my name's Teddy. I'm one of the aquarists here at the Long Island Aquarium. And today we're gonna be talking about some of the amphibians that we have here uh, at the aquarium. We have just about seven species of amphibians that we're gonna talk about. Now amphibians um, are a grouping of animals ranging from frogs, toads, salamanders, and newts. Um, and usually with that grouping of animals, they spend majority of their life uh, in or near water. So we do have a variety of different amphibians here ranging from a couple species of frogs, um, a t species of toad, and also uh, a type of salamander as well. Um, next to me, we have the axolotl, or the Mexican walking fish. Um, the axolotl is actually a very interesting uh, amphibian, uh, and they're unlike most salamanders and amphibians, where usually amphibians during their larval stage um, will spend most of their time in the water. Uh, for frogs, it may be a tadpole. And as they grow to adult, adulthood, uh, they will metamorphosize um, and grow their hind legs and emerge out of the water. Axolotls um, spend their entire life in the water, whether it is their larval stage or their adult stage. You'll see right next to their head, they have external gills, um, and that is how they absorb oxygen flowing throughout the water column. Now, Axolotls are an endangered species, a critically endangered species. They're found in one lake in Mexico, naturally. Um, most of the common axolotls that you will see, whether it's in pet stores, aquariums, um, are almost all captive bred at this point. Uh, the wild type that you will find out there generally is a greenish brown color. Um, and there are some albinos that do emerge in wild types, but generally with albino species, there aren't, the genetics aren't as passed on. Now, this species is actually a leucistic species, which is a captive bred. While it does have the albino coloration of no pigmentation, if you look at their eyes, they actually have dark black eyes. Right now, you'll see our axolotls just foraging through the rocks looking for food. They feed on bloodworms and uh, earthworms, a few other types of insects that will feed them as well. So in this habitat right here, we have a pair of our poison dart frogs. Um, these poison dart frogs are the species Dendrobites tinctoris. They're a very popular um, dart frog that you usually see in most facilities or if people do own 
uh, dart frogs as pets. This is a common one that you will find. This species of dart frog has a very bright coloration like most species do. Um, and that coloration helps warn predators and protect them. Um, and predators see those bright colors and they usually, that uh, predators are able to recognize that that means that that animal is poisonous. Like the name, the poison dart frog, it is true in the wild, these uh, frogs are extremely poisonous. In captivity, however, these frogs are not feeding on the same insects that, they're feed, uh, that they would normally feed in the wild that would carry those toxins, therefore making these frogs not as toxic as wild species. Now, that doesn't mean to go and handle or touch any of these frogs, even if you do have them as pets or um, come in contact with them. Just because our hands, the oils on our skin, could affect their skin, frogs' skin and all amphibian skin is extremely important to them because it's actually where they breathe from. You'll notice that in all of our tanks, you'll see a lot of moisture, water, and water residue left behind. And we have to keep these environments extremely moist and humid so that the frogs are able to breathe. Most will actually have a, bo a smaller body of water for them to go into as well if they feel uh, the need to submerge themselves. If we move over next to the dart frogs, you'll actually see a species of toad that we have, or um, the Argentinian uh, horn toad, or the Pac-Man frog, as we like to call them as well. Um, one of my favorite species of frog. If you see what he's doing right now, that's what he does almost every day. Uh, kind of finds a nice little spot to hang out and waits for food to come to him. They are ambush predators, so they will stay extremely still. And as uh, prey comes close to them, whether it's a small rodent or insect, they will then launch out, grabbing that animal and bringing it back towards their area and then feeding on it in the spot that they're sitting in. Now, I did say that these guys are toads. Generally, there are a few distinct differences between frogs and toads. Um, frogs, for the most part, will spend most of their life, uh, uh, adult life, outside of the water, but will always need to be near water, uh, whether it is to keep them their skin hydrated or to come back to lay eggs. They're almost always found around water. They usually have longer back legs um, for a much longer or stronger jump. Uh, and they're usually slender as well with smooth skin. Where the toad is a much thicker, sturdier, uh, and stockier body type, shorter legs, and a much bumpy, rougher skin. Most toads are able to forge a little further away from the water um, and you could actually usually find toads in your home gardens. Um, even if there is no water close to you, that's, um, those frog uh, toads are able to journey out. See if you're able to spot the next frog in this habitat. He's one of my favorites in this whole facility. He is called the Vietnamese mossy frog. Now, mossy frogs, of course, get their name from the description of what they look like, those characteristics of looking just like moss. Usually, they will spend their time dwelling in water or very close to the water around patches of moss and waiting for prey to come to them. Similar to the Pac-Man frog, they are ambush predators. So while they are waiting in the water, they'll wait for insects, smaller fish to swim by or move by them. They will launch out, grabbing those insects, and then moving back towards the area where they were hiding last. Mossy frogs, like a lot of tree frogs, are actually nocturnal species. So what you see him doing right now is hiding, because it is daytime. It's sleep, it, usually for a frog like this, he will spend most of the day sleeping. And then once the sun goes down and most of the insects are out and abundant, that is when this frog decides to go hunting. So in this habitat, we have a group of Santa Isabella dart frogs, which are native to Ecuador. Um, these dart frogs have a very uh, nice call to them, where you'll hear the males calling for the females over all hours, um, usually looking to mate. Now, these, this grouping is a 
grouping of pairs. So we do have some eggs in this habitat as well. Uh, generally, dart frogs will lay their eggs near or close to water. So if you look up towards the bromeliad on one of the leaves, you'll see a cluster of eggs. Generally, bromeliads are filled with water towards the center where uh, dart frogs and other smaller species of frogs will, as the tadpoles hatch, the tadpoles will actually live within those bromeliad uh, uh, water basins. Now, if the bromeliad tends to dry up, or if the body of water that that tadpole is in dries up, while some dart frogs may not care as much for their young, the Santa Isabella's cares for their young quite a bit, actually, uh, all the way up until adulthood. So if they feel that the area that the tadpole is in is not adequate or safe for the tadpole, they will actually uh, move the tadpole onto their back and then transport it to an area that is much safer for it to survive, whether it has more water, less predators in that area, safer environment, whatever it may be. So this species of frog acts way more like a parent than some others do. So in this habitat, we have the borneo ear tree frogs. They get their name from the protruded structures on top of their head that kind of look a little bit like ears. Now, they are a species of tree frog, so like most others, they are nocturnal, spending the daylight hours sleeping and resting, and then the nighttime hours used for hunting uh, for insects and other smaller reptiles and animals they may find. Now, with tree frogs, generally, unlike the dart frog, they will lay a cluster of eggs over a body of water, and then usually the parenting is done from there. The eggs will hatch out, the tadpoles will drop into the water, and it's the tadpole's job to then survive uh, all the way up to adulthood. For a tadpole, generally, they will have a round body with a tail and gills, and as they metamorphosize, they start to grow front arms and back legs, and the tail begins to shrink along with the gills being one of the last things to be removed from their body. Now, once that does take place, generally you'll see froglets, uh, which do have a little bit of a tail left, but full front and back legs emerging out of the water and it staying close to the bodies of water that they were born in, but climbing up the trees and other plants in the area and becoming the tree frogs that they are. So I was talking before about the metamorphosis of an axolotl and how it really doesn't go through any, um, how they stay from their larval stage all the way to adulthood and they never emerge out of the water because of those external gills. Now, Cold Spring Harbor Labs actually in uh, injected axolotls with a thyroid hormone to induce a metamorphosis in them which um, removed those external gills from them and they were actually able to emerge out of the water like most salamanders during their adult stage are able to. Teddy introduced us to the amphibians and I hope you saw that the amphibians must spend at least part of their life in water and so that's what amphibian literally means is of both worlds so uh, they're closely linked to water. Reptiles on the other hand like this green iguana here are uh, a little bit more adapted to a terrestrial lifestyle. And so Maggie here is our reptile keeper as well as our senior aviculturist. And she um, is holding this green iguana here. It's one of our older specimens. And um, as you can see, he's perfectly fine being out here in the sun. And uh, he's a little, <laughs> a little freaked out right now. He's one of the older uh, individuals that we have. And so, as you can see along his back, he's got these, this sort of scaly skin. That's what we're typically used to uh, thinking about when we think of reptiles. And that scaly skin is one of the first adaptations of reptiles to living on land. So they don't breathe through their skin like amphibians do. Um, they also have uh, their eggs which are capable of surviving on land. They don't need to be closely linked to water. And this is an important development in the evolution of vertebrates. So the idea of an amnion. And so reptiles, mammals, and birds are known as amniotes because of this fluid that they produce inside of their egg, which moistens and nourishes the egg, uh, allowing it to survive on land away from water. 
And so the iguana is a type of lizard. Uh, he's just one of the many different species of lizards that are out there in the world. And uh, let's go through and talk about some of the different types of reptiles that we can find. So just like with the amphibians, I wanted to kind of go back to the vertebrate tree of life here for a moment, just to kind of get an idea of where we're talking about when we're talking about all these different reptile groups. Where do they fall in the tree of life? And of course, these guys are all tetrapods still, just like the amphibians. Um, but they have this adaptive amnion, this membrane that allows their eggs to uh, essentially um, remain on land. And that's one of the, the features that allows them to be a little bit more successful on land than their amphibian um, uh, uh, ancestors. And uh, so that if we think of the, the groups of you know, quote unquote, reptiles that we know of, I put that in quotes because, you know, nowadays we really don't, reptiles isn't really a, a term that, that, that means that that's, a, that's an official taxonomic term, you know. So think about all the group, all the reptiles that you might be familiar with, like turtles, lizards, snakes, crocodiles, uh, et cetera. But, uh, you know, they're not, believe it or not, <laughs> all within one well-defined group. At least that's what the morphological and molecular evidence seems to point to and it's a little more complicated than that. So that term reptiles really doesn't have a lot of uh, true scientific meaning. Um, notice that there's also this group here known as, known as the tuatarans and that's a lizard looking um, organism but it's not quite a lizard. I'm not going to talk about those guys because I don't really have any of them at the aquarium and um, but they are pretty neat in their own right. And so uh, that term reptiles, you know, if you really wanted to be more accurate, you'd have to throw in birds, believe it or not, into that, uh, that term, because it seems that birds share an ancestral heritage with many of the uh, current modern day reptiles that we know of, which is pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so if we get a little bit of a better look at this, this is from a, a textbook called Evolution, just a common textbook used in evolutionary biology courses. And the lizards and snakes, notice, are right up here. Um, so this whole group, by the way, refers to uh, the seropsids. And uh, this is counter to the synapsids, so the mammals, essentially. So we're just talking about the seropsids here. And the lizards and snakes are right up here. Those are known as lepidosaurs. But they branch off to this whole other group down here. Okay, which notice includes dinosaurs and pterosaurs, so the things that you're typically used to thinking about when we like think of like Jurassic Park, right? <laughs> um, so these are all known as archosaurs. And I'm not going to get into the specific nitty-gritty differences and details between these lineages, uh, but just know this is how that they're grouped today. So notice that crocodilians are in here in the archosaur group. Uh, they form one of the most ancient lineages of the archosaur group. Um, we have pterosaur, you know, like your typical pterodactyl, and um, there's quite a few different types of those. And then we have our typical dinosaurs, the ornithischian and the saurischian dinosaurs, from which birds have diverged. So if you get a kind of look at this holistically, notice that birds are almost like a, a lineage that uh, separated off from the common ancestor of crocodiles. Um, crocodiles, and then ultimately from diver this whole birds diverge from. Uh, the common ancestor of both the lizards and snakes, uh, as well as other other reptiles. So that's why I say, like the word reptile, I think you typically want to be referring to all of these guys uh, if you really wanted to use that word accurately. And uh, that being said, let's get a look at some of um, the common living groups of reptiles today and learn a little bit about their different adaptations. My name is Colette. I'm here at the Long Island Aquarium to talk about some of our really cute little reptiles that we have. This is one of my favorites. This is a sandfish. So if you guys can look in, he's hiding right now. But the reason they're called a sandfish is because their ability to look like they're swimming through the sand. Hi, cutie. So they will do this. They will dig deeper in the sand to thermoregulate. So when it's a really hot day, they might dig deeper under the sand to cool off faster. And opposite, when they're getting a little cool, they'll come up to the surface to get some sun. This is an animal that is found in northern Africa over to Saudi Arabia. You can see they just swim through super fast. Um, reptiles need to thermoregulate because they do not um, keep warm the same way we do. They do not have that warm blood flowing through them, so they need to come up to the surface to get that sun to get warm. 
Um, he is awfully cute swimming through that sand. Um, this is just out so that you guys can take a better look at him, but they have lots of nice deep sand to play and uh, dig through in their habitat. They are insectivores. So what does that mean? They like to eat bugs. They love to eat lots of little bugs and the sand that they live in will help them feel the animal that they are trying to um, eat. They'll dig into the sand and then they will feel the insect walking across the sand and they can come out and attack them because they are predators and they will eat all those insects that they can find. He's also very cute. So this is our sandfish. So this is Daenerys. She is another lizard, just like our sandfish, um, but she's a little different and she's from a different area. So bearded dragons, like this girl, are from Australia. And she likes the nice sandy desert-like habitat, just like our sandfish do, but they live in different areas, right? Now bearded dragons, they're called bearded dragons because of the beard that they sometimes get. Now this happens to be a female, so she doesn't get that really black, dark beard that the males usually get, but when the males are challenging each other or just aggravated, they'll turn actually black right here on their chin, um, and they will literally change their color. They also can talk to each other, they communicate through head bobs and this dark What? Hi. This dark patch that comes underneath them, which looks like a dark beard. Now, bearded dragons, like sandfish, do like insects also, but they are omnivores. So they will eat insects and they eat greens, vegetables, and fruits. This happens to be uh, our female bearded dragon. She has a tongue that's sticking out so she can try to taste things. She has these cute little ears here so she can hear things. She has a lot of the senses that you do at home. She can see pretty well, right? You looking at me? She's quite fast on sand. She'll chase after those insects that she likes to eat. Is that what you like to taste? They do have teeth. Um, she's not gonna bite me because she's super sweet but those teeth will actually help rip those insects apart, right? They usually come in this nice tan color, but they have actually been bred and make excellent pets and you can find them in yellows, oranges, even dark reds. So Colette talked about several of the lizard species that we have here at the aquarium, but my personal favorite group of lizards are the chameleons, like this little uh, girl right here. This is a carpet chameleon from Madagascar. And she's one of the smaller chameleon species out there. Uh, she's actually recently just laid eggs, believe it or not. Uh, but chameleons are a type of lizard that are especially adapted to living in the trees. They're primarily insectivorous, meaning that they feed on insects and they have uh, a nifty little adaptation with their tongue where they shoot it out of their head and there's a little grabby on the end of it that will uh, physically grab an insect. Um, so they have pretty good targeting abilities and that's what Part of the reason their eyes kind of wobble around like Google eyes, <laughs> like this one is doing. And uh, so these guys live up in the trees and you know, unlike the popular, unlike popular culture or movies and things like that would have you believe, chameleons don't just turn color on the drop of a dime in order to blend in with their surroundings. Um, and you know, it's, it's you know, if, like, if, like the, the thought is that if you take a chameleon and you put it on a chessboard or a checkerboard or whatever, it will take on the color pattern of that checkerboard or chessboard, and that's just simply not true. They don't work like that. In fact, their camouflage is just innately sort of built into their coloration and their body structure to begin with. And so they can tweak their color a little tiny bit to help them blend in with their surroundings, but it's not like a full, complete color change. More importantly, their color changes uh, are able to communicate their emotions and their um, social dynamics. 
So here we see another species of chameleon. This one is considerably larger than the little carpet chameleon. This is known as a veiled chameleon. And so, like I was saying before, the colors that you see on the sides of these chameleons, you know, they're, they're, for, they're meant for communication between individuals and also communicating the emotions of the individual itself. So basically, uh, they'll, they'll um, change color to reflect uh, warning and, and, and threatening uh, a potential predator, because um, they're essentially defenseless. So their camouflage hopefully will be enough to keep them uh, safe from getting eaten. And that's why they are stay so still. And chameleons are very well known in uh, popular culture for a lot of reasons. And uh, they're actually one of the most common chameleons in the pet trade as well. Now, they originate from Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And uh, they're basically adapted, lizards that are really specially adapted, I should say, to a tree living lifestyle. So you can see on our veiled chameleon's little toes here, <laughs> they are essentially fused together. And actually, their digits are fused together by connective tissue in much the same way as uh, individuals that are, are polydactyl, um, who are having multiple fused fingers, might have uh, sort of webbing in between their, their uh, digits as well. But these guys use that use those, that connective tissue to essentially gain them a better grip on the branches that they climb around on. And so uh, if you're a bird or something, you have a very difficult time essentially prying uh, the chameleon off uh, whatever branch you might be finding him on if you were trying to eat him. Now, chameleons are basically insectivorous, meaning they feed on insects. And they have that uh, specialized tongue that, comes, that shoots out from their mouth there. He's, <laughs> he's a little angry. He's trying to bite me. Uh, <laughs> he's not a very friendly one, at least with me. But he has a tongue that will shoot out and grip uh, a prey item instantaneously and yank it back to his mouth. Pretty cool adaptation. Their eyes are uh, very um, dexterous in their own right as well. So he's able to look around himself and find a potential prey item crawling around in the branches that he lives in. So chameleons are interesting and all, but I think when people say the word lizard, I think something like this tends to come in mind more often than not. And this is a prehensile-tailed skink. Lizards are actually one of the most diverse groups of reptiles with uh, close to over 6,000 species, I believe, uh, of the 10,000 species of reptiles that are out there are, are types of lizards. And skinks come from the, or the, the, the prehensile tail skink here uh, is one of the largest species of skinks. And uh, they come from the Solomon Islands in Southeast Asia. These guys uh, don't actually lay eggs, interestingly. So they're uh, viviparous, meaning that they give birth to live young. And they're called prehensile tailed skinks because of that tail. You can see it gripping uh, Maggie's arm here as uh, they're moving around here. So another of my favorite groups of lizards are the monitor lizards. And uh, this guy right here is known as a, mo as known as a mangrove monitor. So uh, they come from Southeast Asia. Monitor lizards, of course, are relatives of the Komodo dragons, also from Southeast Asia, from Indonesia. And uh, they are some of the largest and most terrifying of all the lizards. Mangrove monitors here are a little bit on the smaller side. Um, and they're adapted to living in mangrove forests. Mangroves, of course, are trees that essentially live on the shorelines in various of the uh, various parts of the tropics, and uh, they're adapted to living in sort of brackish saltwater conditions. And they have a unique array of different critters that uh, call them home just because it's such a specialized habitat. And the mangrove monitor is one of them. So these guys are capable of diving into saltwater, and uh, they can survive for a pretty long period of time under saltwater, where they'd be eating fish and other small uh, critters that would be found in the, amongst the mangroves. And so they'll definitely wait for the mangrove, for the uh, tide to go out, and then when the critters, such as crabs and uh, insects and things like that, come out and start um, um, feeding on uh, the stuff that is left behind as the tide recedes, these guys will take advantage of those uh, decomposers and scavengers as well. You can see him uh, sticking his tongue out much the same way that a snake would. And um, so we'll talk a little bit about what that is momentarily. So we're back with another reptile, but this time we have a beautiful snake. So this is Abigail, and she is a milk snake, right? A lot of people, when they see milk snakes, they get really nervous because she is a mimic. She actually mimics another highly toxic animal called a coral snake. 
but there's a rhyme and you can try to remember it. It's red on black is a friend of Jack. So if the red and the black stripes are touching each other, you know that it's not an animal that is going to kill you. Just like Abigail, she's harmless, super pretty, but she does have the same coloration as that coral snake so that other animals will be nervous around her and not bother her. Now, she is a constrictor and she eats other animals. Not me, I'm way too big for her. But she's going to stick that tongue out that you guys can probably see. And she's going to bring that tongue back to an organ called the Jacobson's organ so she can actually taste and sense what's in the air. So this Jacobson organ is going to be able to let this snake feel the temperature and what might be around in case she is hungry. Now, one of the really fun facts about milk snakes is why do you think that she's called a milk snake? She doesn't look like milk, right? You don't. But years ago, farmers would find these snakes in their barns where all the cows were, and they actually thought that they were stealing the milk from the cows, which I know sounds pretty silly, and we know that now. But the farmers weren't sure why the snakes were all there. They were there actually to get all the rodents, because um, they like to eat mice and rats. But this is one of the reasons why they're called the milk snake, so it's really a fun, interesting fact of why they got their name. Now, she's just moving around me, um, and she is a constrictor, so she could squeeze a little tighter if she wanted, but she's quite happy. But when they eat their food, they're going to constrict. Hi. And um, basically draw the life out of what they're eating and then they're gonna eat their food. They have a jaw that hinges open so they can eat food that's twice the width of themselves. So she can eat an animal that's much wider than her and it gets through that jaw. Now, snakes, a lot of people think they're slimy. She's actually very dry, very, very smooth. She has a beautiful um, scales that are really fun and nice to touch. I cannot stop touching her just because she is not slimy at all. She is very sweet and very soft to the touch, very smooth. So Colette showed you one of our uh, snakes earlier, but I wanted to kind of talk about this constrictor sort of lifestyle a little bit further. So we don't actually have any venomous snakes here at the aquarium. We just have a few constrictors. And uh, this is, for example, a Burmese python. Specifically, it's an albino variety. And she's sitting here next to um, Maggie. She is our uh, <laughs> reptile keeper here at the aquarium, as well as our penguin and bird uh, director. And so um, she is, just to give you an idea of the size differential here, so this is a pretty big animal. And she's a little bit, got a little bit of tood, <laughs> but uh, she is a pretty friendly snake when you get right down to it. And so uh, this gigantic animal here, what she's going to do as a constrictor is instead of biting and injecting venom to incapacitate her prey, she would wrap her massive body around uh, her prey item. And so she can take out animals the size of, honestly, even a small alligator, I would imagine. Um, and she is going to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. And they have pressure receptors on, along, running along their body that are able to detect when a, uh, a prey item is essentially exhaling. And so she's going to tighten her grip each time her prey exhales a little bit further and essentially will strangle them. And uh, <laughs> you can hear her hissing right now, actually. Uh, strangle them to the point where uh, they are no longer alive. And then she'll go ahead and ingest them. Now, if you look on her face here, you can see she's got some little uh, dots coming on her on the front of her, her nose there. Those are thermosensory organs, and basically they're going to be used to detect um, infrared radiation. So she actually has pretty poor eyesight. She can't see very well at all. And so she relies on uh, thermosensation in order to detect her prey. 
And so basically that means that she can see the body heat of other organisms. And as Colette mentioned, uh, you can see her little tongue coming out here. And so her tongue comes out and captures volatile particles floating around in the air. And so like scent, let's say, from another organism, so possibly one of her prey. And she's going to use those to, and then she's going to bring her tongue back in and press it up against the roof of her mouth, which has pores that connect up to Jacobson's organ. And Jacobson's organ is, or also known as the vomero nasal organ, is the uh, sensitive region of her uh, physiology that's able to detect those scents in air that she carries in on her tongue. So she's a pretty beautiful animal. Burmese pythons, of course, are uh, actually at risk in the wild in their native habitat in Southeast Asia. However, in the United States, they've escaped and, or even been let out by pet owners who you know, essentially don't want to take care of these snakes anymore and they let them go. And in the tropical parts of the United States, they become invasive species. So for instance, in Florida, you may have heard of uh, stories of these snakes essentially taking out gators and uh, things like that because they're able to live in the wild and, and grow to these immense sizes. So be mindful when you take on a reptile pet. <laughs> they are a lot of responsibility, and these guys can live for upwards of 35 to 40 years, believe it or not. So uh, definitely a huge undertaking. Let's take a look at another snake. So here we have another constrictor. And uh, unlike the Burmese python, these are called green tree pythons. They also come from Southeast Asia. And they have similar adaptations to the Burmese python. Although the Burmese python is actually more adapted to living on the ground or life on the ground. The green tree python, on the other hand, is more into living up amongst the trees. And so both of them can inhabit trees, of course. But uh, as you can see by the colors, these guys are certainly going to be found a little bit more uh, frequently up amongst branches since their camouflage will do them a service up in the trees amongst the leaves. Now, green tree pythons, uh, a fun little um, behavior that they'll do is they will sit on top of a branch, much like this one is doing here, and they'll wait for prey to come and stumble by them. And then they'll simply jump out and grab onto them, just like uh, in the way that I kind of talked about with the Burmese python. Um, now, one thing I didn't mention is, you know, when, when these you know, Colette mentioned as well that the, uh, these constrictors will essentially unhinge their jaw and capture, um, basically ingest the entire bit of prey uh, in one gigantic gulp. And when they do this, you might be thinking to yourself, well, how do they breathe? How do they get oxygen? Well, it turns out that they'll actually stick out their air pipe from their mouth while they're ingesting a gigantic meal, and it'll allow them to breathe and get oxygen down into their lungs. Pretty neat. And so we have two green tree pythons here, and you can see they're a little bit on the uh, variable side. And they look very similar to a snake that we find in, in, the, in the, the tropical Americas, known as a green uh, tree boa, or an emerald tree boa. And uh, this is pretty cool. So this is an example of what's known as convergence evolution. So the green tree python seen here, and you guys, I encourage you to look up what a green uh, tree boa or an emerald tree boa looks like. But they're completely unrelated snakes, or they're, they're certainly completely different species of snakes, but they look very similar. And that's just because they've both adapted to this lifestyle and um, happen to share similar evolutionary characteristics as a result, similar uh, adaptations, that is. And so this is what we call convergent evolution. But let's take a look at a, another type of reptile, so one that we're a little bit more uh, perhaps familiar with, turtles. So we have some really cute tortoises here with us. This is Maple. She is an African tortoise that's called a pancake tortoise. Pancake tortoises are the fastest tortoise in the world. They are very slim. This is full size. She's not going to get any bigger. And they're pretty fast for a turtle anyway. Now, Maple's baby is over here too. This is Syrup. So you can see the size difference between maple and syrup. And if you look at syrup's shell, syrup's shell is rounded. When pancake tortoise babies are hatched, they have a rounded shell. And as they mature and old, their shell will flatten out so it looks like a flat pancake. And then this little guy will look just like his mom. 
Now, these are reptiles and they lay eggs, and this is actually one of maple's eggs. It takes about nine months for a baby to hatch. And we do have two baby pancake tortoises here at the aquarium. You can see just how fast she is. And now she's done. So like all of the animals that I showed you today, lizards, tortoises, snakes, right? Yeah. They all are gonna lay eggs. They're all leg, egg laying reptiles. There are a few reptiles that do not lay eggs and actually give live birth, like boa constrictors. They will give live birth, but most reptile species will lay eggs, and the eggs are quite large. They are determined, the sex of the animal is determined by the temperature. So depending on how cool or how hot it is will tell us if we're gonna have a boy or girl tortoise like other reptiles have the same, like alligators. So you met Teddy and he showed you guys some awesome frogs and some frog eggs. Frogs being amphibians, meaning two lives, they have to have water. So frog and toad eggs will be found near water. Reptile eggs are going to be found usually in sand or dirt, um, they do not need that water. Our pancake tortoises are desert tortoises, so they don't want to have any water. They also are going to lay one egg at a time and not strands or groups of eggs. Hi guys, I'm Melissa. I'm an aquarist and an entomologist here at the Long Island Aquarium. So I heard that Colette showed you guys some of our pancake tortoises. Those guys are pretty awesome, absolutely adorable. I'm here to show you guys some more of our turtle, terrapin, and tortoise species that we have. We have a pretty decent amount, and I'm gonna talk to you guys about like the differences between turtles, terrapins, and tortoises, because some people get them confused. So I'm gonna talk quick about those tortoises. I don't have any on hand right now, but the difference between turtles, terrapins, and tortoises lies in their anatomy and the way they carry themselves. So tortoises, if you noticed, had a bit more rounded of a foot, more like a knuckle, which they lift themselves up on like this. They also have those opposable elbows to help carry themselves across the land. Whereas some of the turtles that I have here, if you can see, these guys have a bit more of a flipper formation going on. They have little pads and webbing on their feet. This helps them move through the water. Whereas some of our more land-based turtles as well have a bit more of that rounded nub to help push themselves up and carry themselves. All right, so let's talk about some turtle anatomy because that's also really big in understanding the differences of turtles, terrapins, and tortoises. By the way, all of those guys fall under the category of turtle, but their body shape does give them a little bit of distinguishment. So I'm gonna show you guys some of these anatomical parts, help you understand a little bit. Let me find a turtle that's not too fidgety. You gonna be good for me? All right, so just so you guys know, this is a red-eared slider. They are actually invasive on Long Island and many other areas. They can live in warm or cold climates. Um, so you'll find them up and down the entire East Coast from Florida up, up through New York. So if we look at their shell here, this top part is known as their carapace. The carapace extends across this whole way and then it fuses down into their bottom shell. I'm gonna carefully flip turtle over. You normally don't wanna do that. It can cause some spinal injury if you don't do it properly. So I'm gonna support them as they do this and do it slowly. All right, and now this lower shell here is known as their plastron. You can see where it fuses with their carapace. If you look in here, their skin actually fuses in with their shell as well. So a common myth is that a turtle can leave their shell and run away. That is false. Turtles cannot do that. Their spinal vertebrae are actually fused to the inside of their shell and their skin is connected all along here. So I was talking about some of those differences and we're going to use these shell parts we just learned about. So tortoises are strictly land-based. They may occasionally get a little dip in water to clean themselves off or drink it, but that is pretty rare for most tortoise species. Because of that, tortoises have a very thick um, 
plaster on down here to help support them and protect them from rubbing on any of the gravel, dirt, or substrate that they're walking over. Now see my turtles here, they're much thinner in the plaster on area. That's because these guys live in the water column. They spend a lot of their time swimming and floating and will only leave the water either to sunbathe or lay eggs. And yes, turtles do sunbathe just like we do over the summer, but these guys use it to help warm up and heat their body. They're known as ectotherms. If you look right over there, one of my friends is actually laying out now catching some rays. Now, you guys have heard me use this term terrapin, and you're like, what? She hasn't talked about those yet. What's the difference? I don't get it. A terrapin is a mix of both a turtle and a tortoise. Tortoise spends all their time on land. Turtles spend all their time in the water. Terrapins is about a 50-50 split. The male terrapins will spend most of their time in water, whereas the females will typically come out of water a little more often to lay their eggs. Just like a lot of their other reptilian relatives, turtles build nests for their eggs, and they'll lay them and bury them in there. But turtles are not very good mothers, unfortunately. Once they make their nest, lay their eggs, they leave, and they will never help their young, and will most likely never even see their young. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about the differences between male and female turtle. This right here is actually a female turtle, my red-eared slider, like I said. I can tell she's a female. Oh, can I borrow your hand, please? Okay, maybe I'll borrow this foot. There we go. I promise this does not hurt her. She's just a little grumpy. You can see her nails are pretty short right there. That helps show she's a female. Her tail right here is pretty short as well. And if I slowly flip her over again, there's a lot of spacing in here for her to fill out with her eggs and have enough comfortable room to still protect herself. Now I'm gonna pull out a male red-eared slider for you guys to see. Hey, buddy. All right, pretty big difference. Both of these guys are full-grown and mature adults. I'm gonna put her back now that we looked at the two side by side. So this is a male. Males are typically much smaller in the turtle, terrapin, and tortoise area, and that's because they don't need to lay or carry any eggs. Males will also have very long nails, and this goes for all freshwater and saltwater turtles. Terrapins, not so much with the nails um, because their mating is a little bit different. Let's see if I can get his hand out to show you guys. Oh, I can, but you can see them right here. He's being a little grumpy. Males will also have a very long tail. His is tucked up all the way in here. The males use their nails and tail to help latch on to the female during this mating process. So some turtles will mate for just a few hours, but others can mate for over a day. It is commonly seen that male sea turtles will mate for over 24 hours with the same female. So now I'm gonna show you guys some of the different species that I have here as well. So I showed you a bunch of my red-eared sliders already. You can see I have a lot of these guys. Like I told you guys before, they are invasive, and that's because a lot of people get them as pets. These guys can live for over 25 years. So a lot of people don't understand that it's a commitment getting one of these turtles, and they'll either, they've donated them here, or some people will just let them go, which is why they've become such a problem in our local river sources. But I do have some other pretty cool guys. I'm gonna start by pointing out this one right here. This is a very close relative to the red-eared slider. He is known as a yellow-bellied slider. They do have very similar coloration, lifestyles, eating habits. The difference is a red-eared slider has these red bands along the side of their head, if you can see them there. This guy has some yellow bands in that area along the side of his head. That is actually a female, I shouldn't be saying he. It's a she. Some of the other pretty cool turtles I have. I have an East African black mud turtle. If you can see him, he's hiding right in over there. He is full grown, it is a boy this time. So if I could pull him out, you would see that his shell, his uh, plastron, lower shell, is very large, thick, and sturdy. That's because he normally lives in shallower waters where he won't be swimming as much as my red-eared sliders are. He'll actually spend more time kind of crawling along the bottom, moving himself through the substrate. Just like a lot of their other reptile um, relatives, turtles will molt as well. Now their shells are made of these little scale-like structures called scutes. They're keratin-based, and they will flake off every time the turtle needs to expand its shell. So yes, their shell does grow with the rest of their body because they are attached to it. So if you ever see a turtle flaking and chipping off, that's totally fine, it's healthy. That is how they shed their skin. 
as they shed their scutes, their patterns can actually change. So through their ears, your turtle can look very different. Whether it's living in a darker habitat with less light, a brighter habitat with more light, their colors will vary. All right, so this right here is an Australian snake neck turtle. You can see a little bit of convergent evolution. His long neck, similar to that of a snake, is a good predatory advantage that he has. He can reach out and snatch his food from the water. If you watch him now, he's following me, his curiosity, his hunting. Look at him pace back and forth, always keeping his eye on it, extending his neck when he wants to reach it. Pretty cool, right? So just like my red-eared sliders, he spends a lot of his time swimming in the water column. So you can see his shell is pretty thin. There's not a lot to it, making him nice and lightweight and giving him that nice flexibility to move how he wants. And as you see here, this is a terrapin. He's kind of crawling along the bottom, not really levitating himself in the water column. So those guys, are known as painted river turbans. I have another one right here. I have two males. I have to keep them separated because they're a little bit aggressive. But if you guys think they're big, you should see the female painted terrapins. They are huge. So terrapins have a bit of a thicker shell. Let's see if I can snag him out here. Ah, uh, nope. All right, well, he got away. But those terrapins are in danger. They have a lot of trouble mating. And because of habitat destruction, the females have nowhere to lay their eggs, unfortunately. So they are critically, critically endangered with depleting numbers. So I want to talk a little bit about how turtles, terrapins lay their eggs. So like I said before, they're not very good parents. But one pretty cool fact is the mother can control whether or not she has males or females hatch out of her eggs. So what turtles will do is they will dig a hole typically, and the hole will be at different depths and different locations, whether she wants the nest to be cool or warm. If the temperature of the nest is over 81.6 degrees Fahrenheit, those eggs will turn out to be female. If the temperature is below 81.6 degrees Fahrenheit, the eggs will be male. So females may dig a deeper hole because they want the lower eggs to be cooler and the upper eggs to be warmer to mix up the male to female ratio. Oh look, he came back. So even though these guys are terrible at mating, they have some pretty unique ways of attracting the females. All right, you see my painted river tarpon, the stripe along his head and the stripes down his back? Those are to help attract the females. So during his mating season, those colors will actually get brighter and bolder and more vibrant because in the animal kingdom, the brighter the colors, the better the mate and the genetics they may have. So that'll happen twice a year for these guys, and you'll see a very drastic difference. His colors will fade and get very dark afterwards. So we have turtles uh, right here on Long Island. Very often, it's easy to forget about them just because uh, Long Island is so developed, but here we have an eastern box turtle, and he's just kind of chilling here in, uh, in uh, Sunken Meadow Park on the north shore of Long Island. And this turtle is adapted to living in forests. So he'll spend his time on the cool forest floor feeding on snails, worms, and other little invertebrates. And you can tell that this is an Eastern box turtle by the coloring pattern on his back here. Uh, he's got a little orange on his uh, face and his shell. And he's got red eyes, meaning that this is a male Eastern box turtle. Now these are technically classified as vulnerable species, meaning that they are very threatened. So if you're ever to find one of these guys, do not touch them, do not disturb them. Uh, if they're in a road or in a path like this one is, um, you're gonna wanna pick them up and move them to the side in the direction that he is headed. Do not do not disorient them. Um, but yeah, he's pretty cool. See if you can walk in and get a shot of him. It's getting scared, so he's retracting his head into his shell. But he'll be okay. We're gonna move him up onto the path. Hey guys, so I'm here with my coworker, Roberto. He is the head alligator handler here at the Long Island Aquarium. This is Charlie. She is one of our American alligators. There are two species of alligators in the world, the Americans, which we have here. They're local to the southeastern United States, and the Chinese alligators that you can find in the rivers of China. Those guys are known as muddy dragons because of their, the beliefs people have about their habitat and their lifestyle. 
Those Chinese alligators are actually endangered. They are on the critical part of the spectrum. These guys here were endangered at one point, and thankfully they're not endangered anymore. They've made a very, very nice recovery from that. So I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about their anatomy, get you comfortable with the things that make alligators, alligators. If you can see here, these guys have some webbed feet going on. These little sections help them push through the water and swim. These guys will be active in the water column itself. They won't really be crawling around on the bottom. They do have claws and nails as well. That is to help them latch onto logs. And these guys are also excellent climbers. Sometimes you'll see some interesting photos of these guys actually climbing up trees, either to get to a food source or to protect themselves. And then now I'm gonna show you guys a little bit about their snout. So alligators are related to crocodiles and caimans. There are about two species of alligator, 13 species of crocodile, and nine species of caiman. And the way you can tell these guys apart is by the shape of their snout. If you see here, our alligators have a nice little curve going on. More of a U shape, it's a little bit wider. If she was a crocodile, this would be thinning out and it would be a bit more of a V shape here. Also, you can't see any of her teeth when you look at her from the side. And I just wanna point out, this tape will not hurt her. It's just for our protection. She doesn't have any force to open her mouth. She only has force to close it. So this isn't on too tight, just a little snug, and it keeps her nice and still. But as you can see, her teeth really aren't exposed here. That's because she has a larger, wider jawline on her upper jaw, which covers up her teeth. If she was a crocodile, this would be, again, a little bit thinner, and you would see some teeth sticking out and wrapping around her mouth. All right, and here if you look at the tip of her snout are these two nostril holes. This is how she does her breathing. Alligators cannot breathe underwater. They do need to come to the surface for air. An interesting fact about these guys, some alligators actually do need to hibernate. For some that live in the Carolinas here, it does get a little cold over the winter. So what Charlie would do is stick the tip of her snout right here out of the water and submerge the rest of her body. This will allow her to consistently breathe, but keeping her body underwater will help regulate her temperature throughout the winter. So even if the ice freezes over, she's safe. These guys are what are known as ectotherms. So they're, they need to regulate their body temperature using their surrounding, whether it's the water, the air, the sun. Sometimes you guys will see them laying out sunbathing. That's to help heat themselves up. They know when they're getting too cold. So as we travel down her head, we're gonna take a look at her eyes right here. A pretty unique fact again, is that these guys have an extra eyelid, not only the one up here, but one that slides across. This will come over her eye to help um, protect her from anything in the water. It'll protect her when she gets scared as well. So as we travel down her body a little bit more, you see all these rough patches that we got going on here. These are what are known as scutes. She shares these with her um, reptilian cousins, the turtles. These are a hard chitinous material that she uses to help protect herself and form sort of a shell. All right, then we travel down here. If I could show you underneath her, Charlie has what's known as a cloaca. So unlike us, where we have different body parts to help pee and poop and all that, she only has one. That is also where she would be laying her eggs from or go through the process of mating, which is pretty cool. In just a moment, I'm gonna talk about her eggs as well. And then finally, I just wanna point out her tail. See how big and fat this tail is? This is where Charlie stores all her fat and energy. The larger her tail is, the healthier she typically is, which is pretty awesome. So when alligators like Charlie wanna lay their eggs, they can lay up to 35 or 50 eggs at a time. And yes, Charlie is a female, so she could be one of these guys laying eggs. Alligators are actually great parents, kind of like their ancestors, the birds. What Charlie will do is she'll build a nest, whether it's in a hollowed out log, in a muddy area, in some brush. She will lay her eggs in there and then she will guard them, keep them safe. Once these babies hatch, she will keep, take care of these guys for up to a year. She will mother them, bring them food, protect them from any other predators. But after that year, it's all over for those little guys. If they do not get away from their mother, Charlie will end up eating them because she doesn't recognize them anymore. She knows their noises up until about that year mark. So once the baby's voice and vocal cords start changing, Charlie cannot recognize their sound anymore. So if you look at Charlie here, she's only about six to six and a half feet right now, and she's probably maxed out on her size. But other full-grown American alligators can reach up to 15 feet. And that's even pretty rare right there. Most will average around the 12-foot mark. So if you hear any of those crazy stories that someone caught a 20-foot alligator in their backyard in Louisiana, I promise you that is not true. Nothing to worry about there. On top of that, 
Charlie can live between 30 and 50 years, depending on her lifestyle and environment, which is pretty awesome. So before I talked about how she's a good mother, she takes care of her eggs, she builds her nests, and she'll protect her young as they grow for a year. That's very similar to her relatives, the birds. So these guys actually uh, had divergent evolution, but started from the same lineage. That split happened around the Triassic era. Um, you can see a lot of the similarities where it comes in the claws and the nails or talons like some birds have um, in the type of skin material as well as their skull structure. So a lot of you guys might not know this, but birds and alligators have a, another hole in their skull. That hole allows for more space and movement and actually makes them a lot lighter, which gives birds the ability to fly and Charlie the ability to swim well. This is Cashmere. She is my leopard gecko. I've had her for years now. And I am playing for her some calls of baby gators. So that little laser blast sound effect that you're hearing in the background is actually the call of a baby alligator, believe it or not. And, you know, Melissa drew some parallels between gators and current day birds. And I think their calls and the sound effects that they make uh, are one of the ways that I know I look at gators and I say, oh wow, I can see it. I can see how birds are related to these uh, crocodilians as well as uh, distantly dinosaurs. So when you think about these gator calls, think about the typical calls that you hear of birds communicating with one another out there in the forests of your, your very own backyard even, and they can hear them right now. And I, it's so easy to see how uh, these guys are related. So join me next time on the next episode of our vertebrate biology series where we will talk about the birds. See you there. Don't forget to follow us on uh, DNA on uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter and check out DNA LC Live for more cool content. Have a wonderful week.